Welcome to the show, Kevin. Thank you for having me. Oh, man, it's our pleasure to get you on. This was a really intense story. I have to say, when I was kind of like watching the video and reading through the article, like I got just kind of nervous and, and weird. I threw up here. a little when I read <laughs> Did it, you? but I'm over that. Yeah, now. it's pretty gross. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a pretty interesting thing. So first of all, a big pat on the back for having having the guts to do this, because that would be super intense. That's kind of my first question. You met with Scott Breitenstein. He runs Complaints Bureau. Uh, you met with him at his house. He's never given, given an interview before, and he won't even tell people that are close to him what he does for a living. So I have to imagine the scene was kind of uncomfortable walking into it. Explain a little bit about what it was like when you first arrived and kind of that whole scene there. So I had already talked to Scott. I had, I had found uh, his email address on the website and emailed him and just said, hey, I'm, you know, I'm making this TV show about technology called Real Future. Um, you know, I heard about your website. I'd be interested to you know, hear your side of the story. Would you be willing to talk to me? And I sort of thought, like, I'm never going to get a response to this. Um, but to my surprise, he wrote back and he said, sure, I'd, I'll talk to you. And he had no sort of shame about doing this. He thought it was justified. He thought, you know, providing a space for, for men and women to post, you know, stolen or, you know, just nudes from their exes was appropriate. And he saw it as sort of a an extension of his other business, which is sort of Posting forums for complaints against businesses. I mean, that's actually how it got its start to um, the site Complaints Bureau. How much of a business is uh, was he able to run through this site? That's what I was kind of trying to figure out along the way. Like, how successful, how how lucrative is is that for him? Well, it's hard to monetize, right? Because most advertisers don't want to be associated with revenge porn. Right. And, you know, you can't, you can't exactly like get a big sponsorship deal from, <laughs> you know, a big fortune 500 company, we hope but not. he was running Google ads on these pages and they did a fair bit of traffic. I mean, it was one of the biggest sort of complaint sites in, in the world. And I think, you know, he's, he told me that at his peak, he was making, you know, $1,200 a month from just from this one site, which is not a lot of money to, you know, feature your family on, but if you combine it with a network of other sites like he had, sure. it's a living. It's not a lucrative living, but in Dayton, Ohio, it's a living. Now, given the, the oh, yeah, go oh, for sorry, it. given the lucrative nature of what he's doing, I mean, do you think he's actually, you know, really going to wind this up, or do you think this will be reappearing in a later, in a different form, in a later date? So, just sort of for background, so I went there to um, to Dayton to sort of confront. Scott about Complaints Bureau and the revenge porn that was on his site. And we spent two days together talking and filming. And over the course of that, I think he started to sort of understand the pain that he's caused people. I don't think he'd ever really thought about these people, mostly women, as victims before. Um, and I think that, you know, by the end of the time that I spent with him, he really understood what he had done. And I think that made him very uncomfortable with it. And I think, you know, just being confronted about it, being I played him a video from an actual revenge porn victim. And I think those two things together sort of made him, um, you know, think differently about it. And at the end of it, he decided he was going to take down all the revenge porn and stop doing this. Um, and I think that's a really positive thing. And I think it was genuine. I mean, there have been some people who have been cynical and said, oh, he just knew that this documentary was coming out, so he pulled it down to save face. But I don't think so. I mean, he's lost a lot of money as a result of pulling down his revenge porn. Um, and I think it was a, a pretty genuine change of heart, at least on this one narrow issue. Yeah, he had said at one point, the site is a headache, but it's a job. <laughs> um, and, you know, you get you get a real sense of kind of the conditions that surround him. I mean, the video does does more justice than talking about it ever could. Kind of see kind of the, you know, the environment that surrounds him. Um, you know, you hear about these things happening on the internet. It's, it's difficult to kind of put an image behind it as far as like where it happens and where it comes from. And watching the video, you kind of get a sense for, you know, maybe there's a little bit of, I don't know, maybe this is an assumption on my part, but maybe there's a little bit of a desperation uh, aspect to it, you know, you need to make money somehow. It turns out this was making some money, and so uh, and so Scott did it. I, I don't know. I don't know if that's accurate. But I mean, I don't. I don't want to project too much onto him. I don't know. Right. You know, I know why he says he started this site, but I think there's an element of that too. I mean, this is a 
uh, you know, a, a poor neighborhood in a poor city where most people are really struggling to get by. And Scott, you know, unlike most sort of plumber, he was a plumber in his past life. Um, and unlike most plumbers, like he knows some computer code and taught himself HTML and PHP. And so he was able to put this site together. And I think there is some element of that where it's like, this is a job for him. Like this is not, he, he doesn't get any like, I mean, he might get some sort of perverse thrill off it, but it's also just how he feeds his family. And yeah. I think that that's sort of where the cognitive dissonance came in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely think there's a fair amount of cognitive dissonance here. And um, but it's it, the bigger question is interesting because I've, I've heard of other sort other sites like there's one called Rip Off Report. And from a bigger there's a bigger question here about your online reputation. You know, your, your video talks about a third grade teacher and, you know, it's horrible that this picture was posted of her and that it was personal. Uh, but I feel like this happens to a larger degree to a lot of people all the time, businesses and personal people where it's just like someone something is posted about them that is untrue or you know, just that they don't want posted and it rises to the top of search engines and it, you know, it's very hard to go in and, and get that taken down. So, I mean, what do you, what do we do about that? What do, what do people do about that? Is there any solution to that problem? Well, there's been some movement on this and some progress in the last year or so. I mean, we now have 25 or 26 states with revenge porn laws that make it illegal to post revenge porn. Um, but we also have uh, companies like Google, Facebook, and Twitter taking strong action against revenge porn. So now, if you're a victim of revenge porn, someone posts your nude photos online, you can ask Google to remove that from their results. And and that doesn't make it disappear from the internet. Like, it's still going to be somewhere, but it'll be much, much harder for it for people to find it and for it to jeopardize your job or your family or anything like that. So I think this is meaningful, but I think ultimately we're going to need a bigger legislative response against people who host revenge porn, not just the people who are uploading it in the first place. Yeah. And I mean, he had, he had moved ISPs multiple times that they, you know, at one point, I think at, at the point of the interview, he was hosting his, his uh, site in France, you know, different laws over there. He even explained in the video that he can actually sue a woman. There was a specific example of where he could sue a woman who attempts to have her photos removed from the site for upwards of $10,000 uh, when she requests to have them removed. How is that even possible? That I, do, I, I don't understand how that's possible. Like, it's you. You don't want it up there. You asked to remove. I'm going to sue you for asking me to remove your naked photos. Like, how? Yeah, I mean, that that part is totally insane. Like, I I don't think there's any base. I don't think this is okay. an enforceable right. thing that he does. But <laughs> he's, it's scary. It's scary yeah. to have your new photos posted online. It's terrifying. And... So these women are in a position of extreme defensiveness and they're not sure what's real and what's not. So I can, you know, and he's actually gotten a number of women to pay him this $10,000, what he calls like a defamation fine for defaming him amazingly mm. um, and for his time in sort of restoring this revenge porn. So that, that part is totally insane. And I think like it just speaks to the fact that like Scott doesn't really grasp like the moral gravity of, of what he's doing always. Sure. And I, I think a lot of average people also don't. I mean, this came up with the iCloud hack with the pictures of Jennifer Lawrence and, you know, they, they were posted and then a lot of average people just went and looked at the photos and it took her coming out and saying, you know, if you are looking at these photos, you are also guilty. And I think that was something that surprised people that they hadn't really thought of just average people. I mean, we can look at this guy and be like, oh, what a jerk. But, you know, there were a lot of people that looked at those photos and I completely agree with her. I mean, that was her private those were her private photos. Someone came and stole them from her. And anyone who looked at them was guilty. I totally agree with that. And I think a lot of people are like, why did those, you know, here, it's like, why did those women take those pictures and send them to their boyfriends? Like, they're at fault. And they're not. They're just not. No, they're not. And it's, it's uh, Jennifer Lawrence called it a sex crime. And I think there's a lot of merit in that. Um, you know, just I've since the this documentary came out yesterday, I've heard from a lot of people who said, you know, well, if you know, these women didn't want their photos posted online, they shouldn't have taken them in the first place, which I think is totally insane. Like we, you wouldn't blame, um, you know, someone whose bank account got hacked for putting their money in the bank. Like sharing intimate things with our partners is part of being in in relationships, and abuses of that trust shouldn't reflect poorly on the victim. They should reflect poorly on the perpetrator. Well, 
I was going to say, it's it's almost exactly the same argument that we heard 30 years ago, where a woman wore a short skirt, then she was asking to be molested by somebody. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's a very, very dangerous road to go down. For sure. Uh, incredibly powerful piece, man. You uh, And the video is really well done as well. So this is the real future video series. We can expect more videos, probably not more revenge porn uh, <laughs> videos, but um, what other kind of stuff do you guys have in the pipeline? We've got 15 more episodes coming and they'll be going up uh, at realfuture.tv um, and they'll be coming out about two a week. And we've got episodes on biohacking and drone racing and um, and all kinds of transhumanism. And just we're, we're sort of focusing on people who are using technology to change the lives of themselves and the people around them, either for good or, as we saw in this Revenge Porn episode, for bad. Yeah. Well, Kevin Ruse of Fusion, thank you so much for coming on today and talking all about this. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We'll have you back soon.